Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 89. This episode is sponsored by the Impactful Business Leadership Mastermind. The mastermind brings together hungry entrepreneurs and business owners who want to scale their business, get their toughest problems solved, learn best practices, and build their networks. Learn more at impactfulcoaching.com forward slash BLM. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Patrick Haggerty. Patrick is the president of Facts Educational Education Solutions. Prior to that, he was a high school principal, a K-12 school system president, superintendent of the Catholic uh, Diocese, excuse me, of Montana, and the superintendent of the Archdiocese of Seattle, where he led 74 schools and represented 22,000 students throughout Western Washington. Patrick, thank you so much for joining me on the episode today. Well, thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here. Oh, it's really a pleasure. And I know we haven't known each other for all that long. I got to meet you at a a conference not all that long ago, but we've had the opportunity to chat since. And I'm really super excited that you're here uh, for a variety of reasons. As my listeners know, I'm a former school uh, head prior to that, an educator, and it's in my lifeblood. I do a lot of it still coaching and consulting in schools and nonprofits, as well as businesses. And so I'd like to get your take on something that I know I've written about and um, it's, it's just a fascinating thing because oftentimes we think, well, schools are schools and businesses are businesses and never the twain shall meet. They're really very different uh, on so many levels. And that it, there's truth to that. But I believe that there's a lot that school leaders could learn from business owners and how businesses are run, as well as business owners understanding things differently if they got an insight on how schools operate. So what are your thoughts, Patrick, on some lessons that each side of the proverbial aisle could be learning one from the other? That's a kind of a complicated question. I'll do my best to answer it. Um, And I should put it in context for the vast and super majority of my career, I was in private education. So it is somewhat of a business. So it's not for a for-profit business, but it's certainly not a tax supported entity like our public school colleagues. I think the biggest difference between being in a for-profit business and being in a leadership position and being in a leadership position in an education or a private education is the sense of mission and money. We um, always balance both in the for-profit company and in the schools, no mission, no money, no money, no mission. But what's the more important perspective of each? In education, our mission is our priority. But if we are not going to have enough money to do our mission or complete our mission, then it's going to be a failure. The same happens in business where finances can be the priority. But if you don't believe in your mission, then your finances will be a failure. I think the balance of those in both entities is the commonality. I've, in a for-profit business, it's funny if you were to ever hear our leadership meetings, I will often remind them that we're here for children. And if we're really good at, at helping change the trajectory of a child's life, we will have a bottom line that's very healthy. And on the other side, I will tell people when I was in the private school world, We're here for children, but we must collect tuition. We must be frugal on how we spend our money, and we must raise money on top of tuition. Without that money, we can't complete our mission. So there is this sense of commonality and balance. I think there's more commonness than there is being not common. However, the priority for each, I think, is where we differentiate the two. Sure. I I would probably recommend that as a leader in a for-profit business today, I would be much better as a superintendent of a school system now having experienced the business world. But on the flip of that, I think I'm a pretty good leader of a for-profit business because I have been in a mission-driven system. 
and bringing that mission to for profit is equally as important. I love it. So there's there's a lot to unpack there, but the one thing I'm going to ask you, Patrick, is to help us understand that mission piece specifically on the for profit side. It's interesting because I just delivered a talk on this the the other day to uh, nursing home uh, administrators and others who work in healthcare who are really struggling right now, just like our school leaders and our teachers are really struggling with COVID and with staffing and with morale. You know, there are a lot of challenges that both of those sectors in particular share. And I talked about the concept of knowing your why, right? Simon Sinek, the idea Mm -hmm. of really being aligned with your, with your, with your why, your purpose. So for a school, I think it's pretty straightforward, right? Now you could, you could distill it further. You could differentiate, but at its core, Right? A school is there, like you said, to educate children, to transform their lives, to create citizenship, readiness, and all of those things. And we can kind of go through those mission statements with their many bullets that typically schools have you know, plastered on a wall somewhere. Uh, but in a, but in a, in a for profit environment, other than making money, it's not necessarily so clear. And not necessarily do people think in terms of mission as a priority. They might have it in the back of their mind maybe not necessarily so well-defined, but it's there somehow, somewhere. My question is, if you were brought in to consult uh, a business and you were were kind of there and you were noticing that the mission was a little gray, number one, how would you sell? Why would you sell the importance of mission to a business? And number two, how would you help them to develop a mission that goes beyond the bottom line? So let me go with the first one. How would I sell it? And that was sort of my purpose when I came to Fax Education Solutions. Um, I went right from being a superintendent for the Archdiocese of Seattle to starting a company for the Fax Corporation. And I said from day one, we really have to know what we're doing in order to be successful. Our success is determined on changing the trajectory of a child's life. We, We look at taking dollars that the federal government provides for private school children and teachers to say, how can we use those dollars to help a child catch up to their cohort academically without interfering with the school operations and without using school operation funds? So I have been succinct in everything we've said so far for the last five years in building this company that don't ever take our eye off the goal. Our purpose is to change the child's life by making certain they get caught up with reading and mathematics and science. And if we do that well, we will have more people requesting our business and our bottom line will be profitable. If you were to to pull all the people at Facts Education Solutions, you will find that the vast majority of them know our purpose, are focused on it, and they are very missional in how we work. Same thing when we do professional development for teachers. We measure the effectiveness of our professional development on does it have an impact on how a child learns and does that child learnings, is it, is it assessed on a regular basis? Can we, can we correlate good professional development to improve child's academic success? If we can't, we're not fulfilling our mission. So I would, well, we did, we, we brought this company to make an impact in the classroom, total purpose. And if we do that well, we'll have a good bottom line. If I were consulting with a company to say, how do you do this? Or why should you do this? You know, Naftali, every book I've read about business and very effective ones, including the, I remember waiting one many, many years ago, um, Collins and Porus, Built to Last. The most effective companies that they studied in the last hundred years never had anything about the bottom line in their mission statement or in their goal statement. It was always about serving other people or being good for the product of humanity or being socially just. And those companies that are highly successful and highly effective who go with the missional side tend to be the most profitable in the long term. And and I don't think that it's difficult for us to correlate that. So my passion is children and helping them learn to read helping them learn to do mathematics so that they don't become a social statistic in their adult life. Mm -hmm. And if we can do that and make money on it in the end, I'll be pretty happy. Um, It's a win-win right there. It's a huge win-win. 
Yeah. yeah. So you've talked quite a bit um, directly or indirectly about your your career trajectory and sort of how you've moved from various positions I mentioned in the introduction as well. Talk about your leadership evolution um, because you know, oftentimes, and we'll talk about failures a little bit later because we always do, um, mm-hmm. but I, I, I want to first talk about your sense of how you've evolved as a leader. You know, I wrote a book. Um, I'm mentioning it here because it's, it's really the outgrowth of, um, and I think I might have even shared a copy with you. If I didn't, I definitely need to. Uh, but, but either way, either way, I, the book was written. Ah, oh, there you yeah. go. All right. So that, <laughs> that, that book was written as the outgrowth of, honestly, many of my mistakes, right? A lot of the things I did yeah. wrong, I try to learn from them. I wrote, I used the book. I, I mean, I created, I uh, took, took those lessons and try to integrate them in a way that would be relevant for new leaders so that they have real success, learn from my mistakes as well as others. Talk about your leadership evolution, because I'm interested as a leader, me personally, but I'm sure everybody who's listening, they want to know, you know, it's not like you walk in, you're one way and you stay that way forever. The goal is to continue to evolve, not only to meet the needs of a dynamic enterprise, but also to learn those lessons and integrate them into your practice. Well, that's, uh, that's a long story. I'd have to go back when I was a high school teacher in Northwest Montana. I, I was very frustrated as a teacher with my administration, and I kept telling myself, well, I can do better. Um, I would say, I, I think for the most part, I was a very effective teacher. My evaluations were always strong, um, had great relationships with my students and their parents. And so I decided to go into graduate school to see if I could get to be a certified administrator someday. While in graduate school, I began to know that the more I learned, the less I knew. And, and it's really easy to be critical of people in supervisory yeah. positions until you're actually sitting in the seat. Um, and I ended up taking a high school principal's job. Holy buckets. That was like drinking from a fire hose. Um, my first few years of being a high school principal, I felt like I was swallowing water as fast as I could. And there was more coming at me and I couldn't ever catch up. So I would say my evolution of leadership has been always to be a learner and take a step back before criticizing others. Um, I went from being a high school principal, I was asked to be a superintendent of a large system. Um, At that point in time, I I said, sure. You know, I've always believed, Naftali, that if you're called, you should answer the call. And I never applied for the position, but I was asked to step up and, and I said, yes, I would. Um, And in that position, my leadership was myself as far as an office. I didn't, I reported to people for supervision, but I didn't have any people that I was directly supervising immediately through the state of Montana. I would have to drive either 30 minutes to five hours to go see a school of the principal I supervised. So it was a lot of alone time. And I thought I had more answers. And I found out I didn't have that many answers over the course of many years. I think my evolution has been to continually be open-minded and learn. And I have learned over the course of years, the best thing we can do in a leadership position is to take care of our people. If we, if we value the people we work with and keep people as a priority and build those kinds of relationships, we're going to be a far more effective leader in the end. And that has evolved over time where I thought I knew all the answers to, I learned I didn't know much. And then I thought I could work alone. And in fact, I couldn't. Um, My evolution has been a learning swing and it has all come back to the primary importance of building relationships with good people and taking care of them. Wow. So um, I know that this might come across as the Simon Sinek fan club podcast or something, because I've already referenced him once, but I happened to just see a video this morning where he was describing something similar first job with a, with a, with a, uh, you didn't describe this, but with a, with a boss who was constantly berating him and everybody else for their weaknesses, for their, for their poor performance, the insults, whatever it might be. And he said to himself at that moment, I want to be exactly the opposite. I want to be different. And so many of us, and I was the same way. I was a teacher in a school for a number of years. There were elements of the leadership team 
that really rubbed me the wrong way. And I made myself a commitment. I wasn't perfect, but I did make myself a commitment that there's certain things that I would not do just because it happened to me. And I wanted to avoid being that guy, you know, to somebody else. So there is one other thing that you mentioned that I want to go a little bit deeper with. You talked about uh, valuing people, building relationships. And I think it's so, so important. I actually just did a uh, deep coaching session with one of my clients yesterday, specifically on that topic. And, um, you know, oftentimes we think that if we throw money at people, you know, they'll be motivated. And there is a, there is a motivator, you know, money does provide a certain level of motivation, but the research is clear that people want so much more out of a position than, you know, their income. They want, I'll let you talk about it, but I'd like for you to unpack that a little bit more. What does that mean to you to demonstrate value? And what are some examples that you utilize some, some strategies that have helped you to make people feel, hey, I'm valued in this company, I'm valued in this school, and I have a strong relationship with my boss. Um, boy, I, I, I agree with everything you've said, and, and it's, it is a primary importance for me now. One of the things that I do do each year, I'm Catholic, um, born and raised, uh, I would describe myself as a lunch bucket Catholic. I go to church every Sunday and, and uh, don't get overly involved after that. But I do observe Lent, the 40 days of Lent. During Lent, every day, I write at least one of my employees a handwritten card, and I send it to their personal address to tell them how much I value them. It's been a habit of mine for years. As we grow bigger as a company, I find myself writing more than one. Yeah, um, I was about to say, get, that's a longer yeah. Lent you got there. <laughs> <laughs> it is. But, uh, I get up every morning during Lent, very early sometimes, and I have a little stationery, and I I, I remember the days where if you got a if you got a typed letter, you were you were in the you know the the elite because right. typed letters were really rare. And now if you get a handwritten note, it's almost equally as rare. And I take the time to write a personal note to each of my employees during the 40 days of Lent and say thank you for being of value to our company. And I don't just make it generic. I keep notes throughout the year so that I can point to specific things that I've learned about them, have had conversations with them. So it's a real personal note from me as a president of the company it gets to be a little more complicated, but I've received feedback from those notes of people who truly are grateful that I took the time to say thank you to them in a handwritten note. Yeah. Um, it's a, I don't want to make light of it. I don't want to draw more importance to it than it deserves, but it's a discipline that I found I, I must do because I think the importance of people is critical. And it's hard when you become leader of a very large company to reach out and touch everybody. But I do think it's my Lenten observation and, and I, I give it a whirl every year. Now, I also write notes throughout the year. Um, I go through stationery like crazy. I probably write at least one or two notes a day in some weeks. Never have I gone a week without writing a personal note to somebody in our company, uh, both above and below me in the hierarchy chain. But I, I think that it shows that if you take time to reach out you know, with a personal touch and say thanks, or I noticed this, or I want to share information with you, um, it's not easy. It's a time commitment but it's highly valuable and I'll not stop doing that. Beautiful. If I may interject just because it's near and dear to my heart as well. And I've written about it and talked about it many times, including the other day. Um, there was a year in particular where I felt teacher morale was low. I needed to do what I could to build that relationship with them, earn that trust. And so there's a whole backstory, which I'm not going to get into right now, but I did following, actually there's a book that I keep, on top of my desk that every time I have uh, a mastermind group with school leaders in particular, I pull out. It's, um, I think the cover has changed over the years, but Todd Whitaker and some others about motivating and inspiring teachers. It's a fantastic book. And in there, they talk about um, writing these handwritten notes. And what I would do was I would write before the beginning of the school year, dear so-and-so Miss Jones, you know, mm -hmm. I'm really looking forward to, to working with you this year. And then here came the personal touch. One thing that I enjoy about your work is, or something like that. And then I would fill in that blank. So the whole thing, 95% of the letter was boilerplate. 
it was all mm-hmm. handwritten. It wasn't like I just pasted it, but right. the wording was exactly the same. All I differentiated was the name at the beginning and that one quality, that one detail where I'm saying, this is specifically what I'm noticing about you, whether it's your responsibility, your connection with the kids, you're being a team player, whatever that was, and try to be very, very specific. And so many teachers wound up hanging it by their by their wall or referencing it often and telling me about it. It really does make a difference. And I think in this world of technology, we sometimes think, hey, I'll just leave you a voice note or, or something. And, and, and there, that's fine. There's a place for that. But like you said, there really isn't a replacement for that personal connection. I think we need it now more than ever. Boy, I... When I've been superintendent, I used to make the, the comment, you know, we've got voicemail, we got email. I want to do face mail. I actually want to be there in person to say hey to folks. And mm-hmm. I would spend, as a superintendent for the state of Montana, I would spend 50,000 miles a year in my car going back and forth across the state to actually visit with principals and have FaceTime because as we become more technologically advanced, it's easier for us to become technologically removed from each other. And I don't think that's healthy, especially for those of us who are inspired in the education field, which is a person to person field, regardless of how we address it. I agree. So let's actually stay in the education field with a question that I'd like to ask you. You know, I feel that I've never seen educators feel this distraught, I'll even say troubled, yeah. distraught, overwhelmed, understaffed. There's so many variables going on. You know, we're two years into this COVID thing and um, we still don't fully see the light at the end of the tunnel. In many ways, I think the second year was worse than the first year. Uh, I'm not quite sure why. It just seems that there's some residuals that have been accumulating and people are getting hit harder. Staffing is more difficult, all of that. So I'm just curious to know, what, are you, what do you see the greatest challenges facing education? It could be educators, it could be education as a system, and how do you suggest that we address it? I, I think that this COVID, the pandemic era, <clears throat> is an anomaly, and it wouldn't be good for us to measure education based on an anomaly. It is really a wild card if if you ever study futures and they talk about wild card incidences, this is a wild card nobody could see coming and we wouldn't want to bank data on what's happened in the last two years as to where we're going in the future. I, I would suggest overall, especially in the last, let's say, 25 years, the greatest challenge facing education today is building relationships with the parents, the people who entrust their children to teachers. I believe that parents are the primary educators. They are showing a profound degree of trust by allowing their children to be in the responsibility of teachers for more hours a day than sometimes they get to spend with their children. Though there's never a chance where parents daily walk up to a teacher and say, I'm entrusting you with the greatest possession of my life. But that's exactly what's happening is that they're entrusting their, the greatest thing they will ever do in producing children and giving that person, their children to a teacher and saying, for the next six to eight hours, will you please be my representative and treat my child as I would treat them? And I think over the course of the last 25 years, we have tugged on that relationship priority and we need to get back to how do we build relationships with parents? so that collaboratively we can partner together to educate children. I didn't know what um, partnership meant in Natali until we had three babies in diapers. My wife and I had a boy, and then less than two years later, we had twin girls. Mm. And um, we became a partner in, in that raising of three children, and it was quite an experience. When I was a principal, I once heard a couple of teachers talk about parents being customers and clients. And I said, no, 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 no. We're partners with our parents. You know, if I would have looked at my wife and said, you're my customer or you're my client, Mm -hmm. and this is how we raise children as customer and client, we would have failed as parenting. In fact, I probably would have been parenting alone, right? So we need to take a look at how do we partner with parents and how do we build a tight relationship to impact and form tomorrow's future generation together. I firmly believe our biggest challenge right now is rebuilding that sense of trust 
and respect of the parent partnership with children and teachers. Okay, so I, I do want to unpack that just a little bit more, so mm-hmm. I understand it from your the way you're the way you're uh, explaining it. What do you think are the primary reasons for that deterioration, and what would you suggest as a way? And by the way, I think that this is true on the por- for profit side as well. I think in mm-hmm. many cases people feel less connected to companies, less connected to the people that provide them various things. Some some of, some are doing great but not necessarily across the board. So I think this has broader relevance, but coming back specifically to schools and parents and that connection with teachers, what do you think has gone wrong and what are your one or two top suggestions for making it better? You know, I, I'm, I'm not a politically active person, but I did hear at one point in time in a recent governor's race where one of the candidates made a comment about, well, we're not going to listen to what parents tell us teachers have to do in the classroom or something in that context, which just fractured the parent-teacher relationship. And I thought, oh, nay, nay, that's not the attitude we have to have. Whether we teach in a public school, a charter school, a magnet school, a private school, a faith-based school, we have at some point in time as educators, not generally speaking, but I've seen where educators feel like they know more about the children and how to teach the children than the parents, which in some cases may be true. And that's kind of a pervasive attitude that I think is wrong. I think that teachers do know the academic content to teach children. Parents know their children. Their DNA is the same. How do we get those together? You know, we have open, open house nights with schools almost all the time and parent-teacher conferences, either by the quarter or by the term. Unfortunately, those are the only time where we really make time for parents in the school. I, I saw a thing on TV about three or four weeks ago. It was dads in the school, and it was a bunch of dads <clears throat> came into the school to stop the physical harassment of kids in the building. And there was a group of dads that were just wandering the halls every day and making dad jokes with kids. And it totally changed the culture of the school because we brought parents back into the school world. Um, I think that's the calling of education for tomorrow is how do we bring parents into the world of the life of the children in their education? Countries who are really good at educating children in the K-8 world have a connection between teacher and parent consistently. And how do we work together to do this? And the communication is consistent. I think parents are busy, teachers are busy. It's the school leader's responsibility to intentionally connect the school and the home, the teacher and the mom, the parent, you know, the dad, and get them together because we as a community are forming a child. It's not, it's not compartmentalized. And, and I think as school leaders, priority number one is connecting parents, moms and dads, wherever they are, married or not, into the lives of their children at school and intentionally making that commitment and forming it without an option. We're here to form a child. You need to be here, both teacher and parent. Very powerful. All right. So my last question of the segment, I know you've already addressed it indirectly, but I have to ask mm-hmm. it directly uh, because this is a question I ask all my guests. And it's a question that I believe very deeply is at the core of leadership. And that is failure, right? We don't become great leaders by just doing great things and getting lucky or having it all as natural gifts. We do great things because of trial and error, because of mentorship, because of experiences. So Patrick, please tell us um, your, let's call it biggest failure uh, and how you overcame it. I, I have to. I have to say, first of all, I make mistakes every day. There's little failures or big failures every single day. Um, if I ever go through a day without making a mistake, it's well. I I hope to have passed away and I'm in heaven because that's perfect, right? So um, there is that sense of there's not a colossal failure for me. I I can't look back on any part of my career from the time I very first started working to say, boy, I really blew that one in a manner that it was life changing. Um, as far as, you know, I got fired or, 
you know, they let me go because I got rift or I didn't have any of those experiences. Um, but Neftali, I'd say that the biggest failure I had in all of this is in the, especially in the leadership position. And I don't mean to say this in an, an egocentric matter, but I failed to take care of myself. Hmm. I, I, I did a, uh, I, I became a workaholic. In fact, in some respects, I still am. I'm not as intense as I used to be. But it got to the point where in my low 50s, I had open heart surgery. Wow. I had a quadruple bypass because the stress that I had built up in my life and failing to take care of myself got to the point that the doctor looked at me and said, you're about one step away from one of those casualties you see on the sidewalk where people just drop dead. And so I had a real awakening in that my life had turned to completely work focused. I was getting up at four. I was working till midnight. I was eating poorly. I wasn't exercising. I was driven because of the demands of my job. And I had a big time wake up call, um, went into the doctor coincidentally for a different procedure. And they said, well, we should probably have you on the treadmill before we do the second procedure. And I never got out of the hospital. I went from the treadmill to the, the gurney in three days because mm. I was on the edge of catastrophic life ending failure. So my goodness, I would say um, my biggest failure was my focus on work and not focusing on the health of myself. Mm. I had the doctor look at me and said, you know, when you get on an airplane, they always tell you to put the mask on yourself before you put it on somebody else. And maybe you should heed to that lesson. Why don't you take uh, care of yourself first? Yeah, I've been doing quite a bit of that. Um, some of it because of some numbers that I didn't love, you know, at a, at a recent doctor's visit, some of them just in general, because I, I value health and I want to be there for the people that I'm here to serve and, and love and all of that. So really, really wonderful uh, wrap up to that segment and a great reminder uh, that we have to sharpen the saw. We've got to feed that engine. We've got to take care of ourselves and we're going to be there for others. So let's shift to our rapid fire, short and sweet, a really cool thing about living in Montana. Freedom. <laughs> just I'm going to explain that just quick. <laughs> step out and see the world, huh? Step out and yeah, there's a sense of we all just sort of do what we need to do to get by in Montana and you have the freedom to do that. Love it. Okay. I've never been there. I must visit one day. A quote that you live by or think about often? Uh, most recently, it's come up several times in conversation. Covey's quote, begin with the end in mind. Great. And finally, a productivity tip that helps you to get more done. I get more done in the morning before people get out of bed. Mm. So wake up early and get your stuff done in the morning because when school starts, you don't get stuff done. That's right. Okay, so before I ask you for a final life lesson, please let Lead to Succeed Nation know how they can connect with you, learn more about your work, um, and just tap into all this good stuff you got going on. Sure. You can get a hold of me at faxed, F A C T S E D, faxed.com. There's a, that's the company that we started for the Fax Corporation, and they can wheel down to the, about the middle of the URL site. And there's pictures of me and the rest of the team that run FactSet. Beautiful. Okay. So now for that final life lesson, you've given us so much. Um, but as I, as I tell all of my guests, it would be um, a shame on my end if I didn't ask you for one kind of like parting message to, uh, to end this episode. Wow. Um, parting message. Never underestimate the importance of building positive relationships of respect and trust with moms and dads and children. Beautiful. All right, Patrick, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I've gotten to know you just recently, as I said before, yeah. um, I feel like every interaction just adds that much more depth to that connection. And I certainly look forward to making it deeper over time. In the meantime, stay warm, stay safe, <laughs> continue the great work that you are doing. And uh, really, thank you so much for being with me today. Uh, thank you, too. It's been a pleasure. Have a great day today. You as well. Bye-bye. Okay. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review the show. Your feedback gives the show more social proof and encourages more folks to listen. 